Welcome to this week's Rider Support. This week we're going to talk about essential winter kit you need to be buying. Wait till the end because we're going to discuss a bizarre bike liability issue between club mates. I don't know what's going on with these lads. But first we're going to deconstruct a non-successful cycling training plan and try and help a brother out. Sarah. Anthony. Okay, let's get straight into it. We've loads of questions. Dale's in trouble. Dale is in trouble. He says, I'm at the point of despair. I'm a 42 year old. I have two kids and a full time job, but I'm very committed to the bike. I'm a cat three rider. My FTP is 285 watts. My weight is 71 kilograms. I've been committing about 15 hours per week to my training for the last year. And I'm getting worse. I've been really motivated all year, but the lack of progress is starting to affect my willpower to train. A typical training week for me is Monday easy, Tuesday hard interval session, Wednesday club race, Thursday Zwift session, Friday easy, Saturday club run, Sunday open race. Any light that you can shed on this would be really helpful, Dale. Oh, he's poor Dale. Dale's got himself a classic case of cumulative fatigue. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like having glandular fever or mono, but it's, yeah, as you said, you've, you've done this to yourself, Dave. <laughs> Dale, Dale, sorry. Dale. He's got a case of training stress and life stress. And this isn't uncommon for athletes who are balancing full-time job, demanding life responsibilities, family responsibilities, but also very ambitious and motivated. You do see this with a lot of high achievers who are very high achievers in a family sense. They're building like a very, you know, high performance family. The kids are, you know, progressing in loads of activities and then they're going off and they're building this high power career as well and they're climbing the corporate ladder. And then they think just applying the same intensity across the sport works doesn't really. And I know I'm forever pointing people back to podcasts. I'd love to at some point we should sit down and create like almost uh, like a resource for people that have a problem. Here's the section of this podcast you need to listen to. But think about total life stress for a minute. Dale's 42. He has two kids. He has a full time job. You would imagine some amount of stress comes with kids, job, functioning relationship with his wife or girlfriend. All that stress accumulates and creates cortisol, stress hormone. And your body doesn't differentiate between stress from those and stress from training. So the total cumulative stress that he has is just very, very high. And when that chronic stress gets really high, it's going to suppress stuff like immune function, it's going to suppress recovery, and it's going to make it harder for your body to repair and grow after an intense workout. So without that adequate recovery, you're going to see fitness plateauing. We've referenced it a load of times, but I just think it was, in its simplicity, it was brilliant when Matej Mohoric talked about the function of training is to get better from training. So training doesn't make us any fitter. Training plus recovery equals the adaptation that we're looking for. So Dale has left no space whatsoever in this training plan to get adaptation from his training. His training week looks very hectic, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's seven, if I'm not wrong, it's seven days a week. Yeah, well, look, there's some easy sessions in there, but look... Okay, give him, let's help him out here a bit. So unpack his week. So he's Tuesday, Monday's easy day, which is quite typical. Then he's Tuesday, hard interval session. Wednesday, club race. His whiffed on Thursday, which is hard again, probably. Saturday, he's got a club run, which can have varying intensities. Definitely periods of it is going to be hard. And then a race on Sunday, which is going to be intensity. So that's four or five sessions hard in a week. It's too hard too often. Stephen Saylor, physiologist I had on the podcast, he said once to twice is the maximum intensity per week. And the unglamorous reality of the rest of that time, it needs to be quite monotonous zone one and zone two riding to give ourselves that, to give ourselves that space to get the adaptation from the hard training. I, I, I think that's it from him. Also, like his question was short and maybe he is already doing it, but like the basics of periodization, periodization, works off can we stress the system until it adapts now can we give it a different stress until it adapts can we give it a different stress till it adapts then can we decompress and let it grow so we typically see a three week build block where week two builds on week one week three will builds on week two and then week four is decompression block to allow us to breed and as the french would say absorb those training gains i would be looking out dale for signs of overtraining, which could spill into signs of chronic overtraining. Persistent fatigue, irritability, like what's your whoop data saying? Like 
if you're wearing a whoop what's your recovery scores on that i'd be looking poor sleep lacking motivation which you already flagged in the question higher perceived effort than normal in during sessions as well John Wakefield talks about a sub-maximum fatigue test in one of his things. I think stuff like that would be worth checking out as well. And yeah, I think I mentioned sleep already, but that's an important one, the kind of disrupted broken sleep. Mood, sleep, libido, I think. Are kind libido, of, sure, yeah. that in the mix. <laughs> Crowbar that in. Well, Dale, I mean, you need, do need to watch out for these things, but like, I totally agree. Okay, so I... Anyone who follows me on Twitter will have seen that this week I was, I'm responsible for responsible for taking the clips out of the shows and sending them to our amazing um, editor, Wes, and he takes them out. But I watched the Vasilis Anastopoulos. Anastopoulos. So he is Mark Cavendish's coach. And it was, y- you guys made a very interesting point because I would initially straight away go to Dale and be like, you probably don't have a coach, but that's not totally true because sometimes people will have a coach, particularly if he's a high performer, like Dale does sound like he is, and he's maybe pushing his coach coach to give him more sessions, harder sessions, get more bang for his book. And his coach is maybe like, well, you know what, I have to earn my crust here. And if this is what Dale wants... I'm going to have to give it to him. Yeah, like I think he can definitely start to break if he has a good coach and his coach really knows him, understands intimately his lifestyle, his stressors, his motivation level, point of his development. You can take more than the one session a week of intensity, two sessions a week of intensity. You can look at the overall intensity of the week, like looking at stuff like IF scores. But I think for Dale, he needs to be just focusing on basics here. It's clear that he has chronic stress across the week and cycling looks like it's contributing a huge part to that chronic stress. Also, 15 hours for a cat tree is insane. 15 hours for like a cat one Conti rider, fine, but 15 hours for a cat tree is massive. That just goes to show his ambition as well. Yeah, it really does. And it must be so demoralizing for him, as you said, to have plateaued at this point. When you're in a hole, you need to stop digging. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, Okay, Dale, hopefully that helped. Okay, next question. Settle this for me, banana. (laughs) <laughs> is that a, the whole question <laughs> hi Sarah this is potentially a question for rider support that you guys do this is a message in on DM on Twitter so let's set the scene I was doing an Audex event two weeks ago around 35 kilometers in myself and a friend stop at a crossroads in the middle of nowhere to have a banana and a swig of water I threw the banana peel into the ditch and got told off by a passing third cyclist saying don't be throwing shit around. To emphasise, it was just the peel, no plastic, no paper, into a ditch miles from anybody's house. What are your listeners' thoughts on this? Am I in the right or must I be paraded down the Champs-Élysées in my liker getting banana skins thrown at me akin to the Game of Thrones? Shame meme. And that's from Barra. I'm sure you're more into environmental footprints and you'll probably have a better idea on the decompostability of banana skins. But like for me... Like, people love virtue signaling. Like, is this the same lad shouting at you, the third cyclist is coming along, riding a carbon fibre bike, which is totally non-biodegradable? How often is he changing those out? Is he upcycling them? I absolutely doubt it. I got shouted at before for throwing a banana skin by a lad in an Audi SUV. I was like, <laughs> cut yourself on. What are you shouting at me, throwing a banana skin? So, yeah, people love to virtue signal. I would suspect, I throw banana skins away, I'd suspect it is limited negative to the environment. Is there anything as bad as coming home from your spin and you're emptying your pockets out and you put your hand in on top of a banana peel that's been getting warm yeah, and mushy? Now, it's really, really now, awful. I, I will preface this to say, like my number one pet peeve probably in the world is people that are happy to carry a tube around for like four months, right. but then they puncture and they're not happy to carry the 10K home and they're tossing their old tube on the side of the road. It's like, what? <laughs> Yesterday coming home from my spin, I saw a gel wrapper two foot away from a bin and I was just like oh god okay so look it's not it is compostable it will eventually degrade banana skins do take quite a long time to actually fully uh, you know degrade but first of all it does cause a thing called visual litter which isn't nice and it's just kind of giving cyclists a maybe a 
you know, kind of more of a us versus them and cyclists can do anything, you know, would if I was walking down the street, would I throw a banana peel away? Now, I know he's in the middle of nowhere, but and, you know, if it, Do the if birds it, eat her up? No. The bird, so this is my next point. It's non-native material. So even though it's organic, it's not native to Ireland's ecosystem and it can add these unwanted substances to local plants and that's in huge quantities. If you're if you're throwing the odd banana into a yeah, dish, throwing a lorry full of bananas it's away. It's not going to disrupt an entire ecosystem, you know, 10 miles in diameter. The other thing to watch out for, though, is that wildlife. So even though they're unlikely to harm wildlife, they can attract animals to the roadside to pick them up. So if you are choking them, really put them far into the ditch um, and yeah that's really it I mean it can sometimes get in the way of local food chains I mean so toss it or not I I don't know I don't really have a straight answer after me giving you that information about non-nation material what do you think still on the fence me too I haven't a clue Barra I don't know but I have to say I would never come up to a cyclist and be like don't throw a banana peel away but no, look, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't eat bananas on the bike, so, yeah. <laughs> you, move move you to no dates. Opinion. <laughs> okay, next, next question. question. It's starting to feel like winter. I'm new to the bike, but I need to buy a few things for my bike and kit for winter. What can a cyclist not skimp on for the winter? And that's from Glenn. I love, it's my favourite time of year to ride. This is the, the, these questions start coming in thick and fast around this. Yeah, everyone's scared it, of the winter as well. Yeah, if you've come, if you've come, new to cycling you're like oh I've got the shorts I've got the bib shorts I've got jersey and maybe I've got a long sleeve you know if you're in Ireland and then you come to winter and you're like oh the, the shit just got real but here it's free. well you haven't quite grasped yet because you're new into it is winter's our new year's resolution so you know the way new year like everyone's like I'll do the dog on it over Christmas and then new year I'll be a totally different person that's winter for us so it's a dreaming season. It's a blank canvas for next year, you know, I'm going to break the world error record. I'm going to qualify for the Olympics in mountain bike, road, track. You can be whatever you want coming into winter time. And then like by December, you're like, oh no, it's not going to work out for me. Next year, I'm going to ride Ross Naman. There you, you go. Here See, first. Anything is possible. <laughs> dreaming season. But I love riding this time of year because it's quite far away from races and you're just riding. People that don't like riding in the winter basically don't like riding because you're riding with no objective at this time of year, just for fun. His question's about kit. Uh, there's so many cool pieces of kit you can get for this time of year. I think mud guards, if you're in somewhere where it's raining, is going to be the best bang for the book in terms of keeping you warm and dry. But, you know, they're not very glamorous. I like having different types of kit. Like I'll have two or three different sets of gloves for different temperatures. I think that's really important. That would be my number one piece of advice. Different sets of gloves. Yeah. yeah. So you need like really thick gloves when it's cold. You need lighter gloves. There's nothing as bad as if it's not cold enough for the gloves that you have yeah, you and your hands get hands sweaty and, and it's just really, really awful. So I think I actually picked up an amazing pair of really light running gloves and They've done me like for most of the season last year on, until it comes to those super cold days. But for me, gloves are the number one but thing. But then I'd say the same with shoe covers, like different types of shoe covers. You know, you can go the full on ASOS ones that come up past your calf and give you that mad protection for the deep winter days where it's pouring rain. But you also need something a little bit lighter for your ear. I probably have three sets of shoe covers, three sets of gloves and a set of toe covers, which is like... Really pretentious. Yeah, it's bougie. <laughs> Uh, the neck thingy is real good. It's like a scarf you pull on over. Again, another thing that that was on my list as well. So I think it's a snood or a buff or something. They are absolutely amazing, especially when it's cold and that cold air is cutting into your lungs. It's just nice to be able to pull that over Skull your mouth. Skull cap is another one. Yeah, definitely. Really, really but helps. the biggest one that's changed in the last few years. So when I was starting cycling, it was all about layers. You wanted to have like six, seven layers on to stop the cold getting in. That's because all the kit was shit. You couldn't get one good piece of kit. If you have a good jacket now, like I've been rocking the Lacalle horse category jacket. If you have one good jacket and a base layer, that's it. You're done. Like I'm watching some people like Alex Howes and stuff training in Colorado base layer jacket and he's training in the snow that's it the technology's got so good in the base layers and the jackets that you don't have to have on these multiples of layers so I would say a smaller number of pieces of kit but better quality kit rather than having six sets of bib tights loads of jerseys different types of jackets have your variety in shoe covers have your variety in gloves and then a small number of really good we are so excited to announce that we are partnering with Whoop 
Whoop are changing the game when it comes to wearable technology and health monitoring. Whoop is a wearable health and fitness coach that provides you with feedback and actionable insights into your sleep, your recovery, your training, your stress, and your overall health. Sarah and I have been using Whoop for years, and we love the insights it provides into our body's inner workings. It really gives us a look under the hood. And you're gonna see Matthew van der Poel, Richard Carapace, and other elite level cyclists wearing Whoop, but it isn't just for those superstars. All the data is personalized to your unique physiology and fitness levels. If you're interested in taking control of your health and your fitness, so that you can excel in all aspects of your life, you have to go and check out Whoop. Go to the URL now, which is join.whoop.com forward slash roadman. I'm gonna pop that in the description below and you're gonna get a free month's access to Whoop membership on me. I promise you won't regret it other core elements. Yeah, I totally agree. Don't skimp on your leggings. So I was stopped at a coffee shop in the middle of winter last year. I was completely decked out in winter kit. And one of the, the chaps having a coffee beside me was in bib shorts. And I was like, would you not get yourself leg warmers or you not perished? And he was like, no, sure. Leggings are for soft fellas. No, you've never wear. So it's like this, this also, mindset. No, I think as well, but they don't go for you know, if you only ride the bike four hours a week and you're riding full gas when you leave the house because you don't understand zones, like you're riding threshold to the coffee shop, stopping for a coffee and riding threshold home. It doesn't really matter if you're wearing shorts. It starts becoming a problem when you're doing, okay, I've, I've two hours in zone two to do today or I've an hour in zone one and it's like eight degrees out. That's when you start, you know, the lads who think they're brave aren't so brave. Yeah, don't look at me and Anthony. We were so much kid. Even in the summer, I spent all summer basically. Now we don't get very warm summers in Ireland, but all summer in my leggings because I was just doing zone one, zone two rides the entire time. I like to be a little bit cosy. Okay, next question. Hi, Anthony. I gave a club mate a lift to a sportif the other day. I have a bike rack that you attach onto your car hitch. I finished the race first, so put my bike on the rack. When he finished, he put his on and we secured it with the straps together. He texted me later that night saying his frame was damaged and me, my bike rack and my straps were at fault and I would need to pay for a carbon fixing if possible or a new frame. I'm completely flabbergasted and I feel like I'm being conned. I haven't written back yet. I'm awaiting you and Sarah's advice. And that's from Alex. New phone, who dis? <laughs> Block. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. This He's is... got a neck on him. <laughs> what the hell? But, this is crazy, I said. Yeah, but like your man but this has is got like... mental health issues. <laughs> But this is like, you know, you you pass somebody their bike, you know, it slips, it's it, it cracks a frame or I, there's so many scenarios where damage can happen to a bike and it's well, okay, well, hey, like, but, so, like, let's are first, we that litigious? First, like he secured the bike onto the rack. With his help, though, it says here, when he finished, he put his he put on, his and, we bike on. and we secured it. So, yep, so he put securing, it onto the rack. But he's blaming the straps as well. He's not just... Blaming the rack. He's not just blaming the rack, rack. He's blaming the straps and how it was attached. Okay, so if you were to even indulge this fallacy for a minute, it's highly unlikely that putting the bike onto a bike rack is going to cause damage between one frame and another. Yeah, carbon frames are historically known to be fragile, but bike racks are designed to avoid that exact scenario. That's the whole point of having a bike rack on it. They're designed to avoid that scenario. But like, if you wanted to put the legal hat on for a second, like did one flow from the other? Like what did the damage flow from him putting the bike on the rack? Sure, we haven't a clue. The bike could have been broke before he put it onto the rack. Like it's totally ridiculous to say a natural and probable consequence of putting your bike on the rack is that it's broken. His bike could have broke two weeks ago Absolutely. and he just put it on the rack. Well, it's This funny. lad's an absolute charlatan. I yeah, it's funny here that Alex said, I feel like I'm being conned. And Alex... Rightly so. You should feel like this. Well, no, there's no proof that the rack damaged the bike. No, absolutely not. What would you advise for Alex to write back to this club mate? This is somebody, a club it's mate, like who's idiot. friendly enough to go to a sportive with. You're an idiot. You're not getting a penny. Where's my petrol money? <laughs> <laughs> and you owe me for that scone I bought you in yeah. 2019. <laughs> Get out. Next. Wow, there's, there's some frightening people out there. Yeah. So Anthony's, yeah, Anthony's advice there, Alex, is to... 
ignore him. No, text no, him. call him an idiot. Text, call him an idiot. Yeah. Okay. Just cut out the clip and send it to him. <laughs> okay, next question. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for your podcast the other day where it was just you speaking about how the bike j- just keeps pulling you back in. This is something that I can relate to. Even though I try to take of, of other hobbies, I still slip back into my infatuation with cycling. I now have two kids, though, and want to show them that trying all sports is a good thing rather than just pigeonholing into one particular sport. Do you think that encouraging them into different disciplines of cycling could work, i.e. mountain biking, cyclocross, road cycling, or am I just kidding myself, Marco? How many good messages have you gotten and DMs have you gotten since you released the two solo casts over the last two yeah, I like weeks? Them. I've done solo casts in ages. I like them. So back, anyone who just hasn't followed us from the beginning, Anthony did two solo casts a week. I did one solo cast a week and it was just basically... I know, six a, a week to start inner, before oh, yeah. you came along. <laughs> an inner monologue. And we stopped doing them then to focus on quality of interviews. And Anthony, they're, they're, they're making a comeback and they yeah. have been striking a chord to people. Yeah, no, I like doing them. Uh, to answer his question yeah I think it's a little bit of both you can get the variety internally within the bike like we ride different bikes bike quite packing, a lot and it keeps yeah. it fresh like you're going from bike packing to mountain biking to gravel to road it never really feels like you're cycling every day if you're riding a different bike all the time but I will say there's probably a core crossover of the type of person that's in cycling like mountain bikers on the extreme end they're different to roadies on the extreme end but the core overlap between the two is quite similar personality trait where if you think about somebody that plays rugby cricket basketball they're all very different types of personalities i think it's good to expose a kid to all those different types of personalities because you know it's coming from a team sports background i played football for a long time the dynamic in a dressing room is very different to the dynamic on a team bus in cycling you know one's not better than the other but no it is yeah football's better but <laughs> the football's way more crack <laughs> But there, there's different types of people. I'm reading at the moment, and I can't tell you much about it because I'm only on chapter two, Range by David Epstein. It's why generalists triumph in a specialised world. And the start of it's talking about, we all know the Tiger Woods story where he specialised so, so early and his dad thought he was this prodigy from the age of two. He was on TV driving golf balls with Arnold Palmer. But the story you don't hear that often is Roger Federer, whose parents actually pulled him away from tennis. They said, no, you're specialising too much. And they threw him into all variety of team sports. And he credits his rise to the top because of that. Like learning to throw an American football helps him with his forehand. And, it, you know, the book tries to deconstruct that because that's a story that we don't hear that often. But apparently there's a lot more successful people that aren't specialists at the start or more generalists. I think as well, Marco, just because you're you're obsessed with cycling doesn't mean that your kids aren't. You're, it's c- c- quite dangerous. My, my mom is, was an amazing uh, hurler, camogie player. And, you know, that that's a sport that I grew up absolutely loving and playing. But she was so obsessed that, you know, I grew up on the side of a, a pitch watching her. But it could have gone the other way where I completely rebelled against it and was like, well, your dream's not my dream. So I think, yeah, you do kind of need to be careful. That is the beautiful thing about cycling, though. There is a lot of variety in there. So, yeah, I don't know. Look, you know your kids better than we do, but I would expose them to a lot more than just cycling. Okay, next question. Hi, Sarah and Anthony. I'm so uncomfortable on the bike at the moment. Aches and pains everywhere. I've had a bike fit about 15 months ago and nothing has changed since then I'm 51 and have been cycling for over 20 years Shane listen to that sense I had a bike fit 15 months ago and nothing has changed since then yeah everything has a changed a lot has changed since then <laughs> never, the man, never the same man never the same river 15 months I mean we had a bike sp- fit specialist on about a year ago um, I'll link the episode and he Dr. Andrew Pruitt he's yes, the, well, not Dr. bike fit specialist the guy he he created yeah. yeah and I'll link the episode and he said that as you get older you need to have a bike fit every six months not even just as we get older though like if you think about what changes in 15 months what changes between me and last week I had a crash on the mountain bike last week all my muscles have tightened up as a result of that you know you're having changes to your body you know, your flexibility, like as we age, we have changes in flexibility, we have changes in joint mobility, we have changes in muscle strength, and they can significantly affect our bike performance. If you look at a period as long as 15 months, 
like they could be quite significant bike changes, especially for areas that are key on the bike, like lower back flexibility, hip flexibility, shoulder flexibility, because reductions in those flexibility can quite easily, a small reduction in those areas can quite easily lead to a massive feeling of discomfort on the bike. But also think about body composition changes in 15 months. You know, did you have a period where you were laid up on the couch for a while or you lost motivation and you've put on or lost five or 10 kilograms, you might have a totally different uh, you know, body shape, which is again, you're going to carry load different and that's going to put a different load on all your muscles. The equipment you're using, is that wear and tear or degraded over the course of those 15 months? Because we do get components that naturally start to break down as well. And maybe even just the physical alignment of stuff has started to move, like shifters have started to move down a little bit. So uh, yeah, I think it's, Nothing's changed, but everything's changed. Yeah. And it's time to go and get another bike fit. Yeah, I think I think you're so right. I think go and get a bike fit. If you're still very uncomfortable, then you'll need to start exploring other avenues at physios and go to your GP and stuff. But 100% bike fit. Okay, very last question. I have been off the bike for three months because of injury. Before that, I was what I would consider a core member of the cycling group and has, have always loved it. It's a solid bunch of about 20 riders, give or take, every weekend. The average speed of about 28 kilometres is pretty consistent every week. Last week, I ventured out with them again and got a spanking. The average speed has gone up to about 33 kilometres per hour, and it's very pacey for me. I guess over the three months, the group has gotten quicker. Can I ask them to take the pace back now, or what's the etiquette here? And that's George. Today's show sponsor is LMNT. I've spoken with most of the world's top coaches and nutritionists on the podcast, and they all agree that getting the right balance of electrolytes, it's key to performance. Hydration, it's not just about drinking water. It's about maintaining the right balance of electrolytes. And that's where LMNT comes in because it's packed with essential electrolytes like sodium, magnesium, and potassium. LMNT, it helps sustain steady energy levels throughout the day. It sharpens your cognitive function and it keeps your muscles cramp-free during tough workouts. So whether you're planning a super intense indoor training session or you're hydrating for a long endurance ride, LMNT's precise formula ensures your body performs at its absolute peak now here's an amazing special offer for you guys this is just for our listeners you're going to get this free sample pack that i have right here with any purchase by visiting drinklmnt.com forward slash roadman cycling this sample pack has eight amazing flavors in it it's perfect for finding which your favorite flavor is. I'm addicted to watermelon flavor. You can also share this with a friend if you don't like some of the flavors. This offer is exclusively available through our link and it's available for both new and returning customers. So head on over to drinklmnt.com forward slash roadman cycling to claim your free sample pack today. I'm going to put that link in the description down below. Like first off, you haven't been out in three months. It's likely that... Uh, Average speed is a very bad metric for judging how hard a spin is. It's likely the group may have got a little bit quicker because we're at the tail end of the season, but you've got slower. So maybe tailoring the whole group spins speed around your fitness levels isn't like appropriate really because you're going to get fitter as the weeks go on. If you're going out and you're getting absolutely rinsed and you're hanging on for dear life, you know, maybe say to the lads, look, I'll, you know, I'll spin off a little bit early or, uh, start training during the week yourself to catch up but i think you're naturally going to catch up i think group spins do see a seasonal trend of getting a little bit faster through the summer months as people start to put in historically or typically longer hours as we go into the longer days because people can get in a three-hour spin after work on a wednesday when it's difficult to do that with uh, indoor training so i would say the group spin will cycle back towards the 28 to 30 kilometers an hour in the winter as people take their winter bikes back out and put their summer bikes away mud guards go on big heavy overshoes and stuff go on people will slow down and you will start getting stronger as well so i don't think it's much of a problem no i don't think so either now i know everyone's going to come for me in the comments but can i ask them to take the pace back now i think that's a hard no even though people as i said if this is a group spin no man's left behind etc etc but think about if you have been 
in this group of 20 riders and you haven't taken that three months off, you're fit, you're enjoying going at speed, you guys have been out there training consistently and then someone comes back into the group and asks you to take the pace back, you're probably not going to want to do that. I think you can modulate it a little bit over brow of a hill and stuff like that so someone can hold on. Like, But if he's just totally on the river for the entire spin, it's just yeah. not appropriate spin for him right now. Yeah, but exactly. I think it's fine to ask someone to slow down over the top of the hill. Yeah, top of the hill. You shouldn't even have to ask. People, yeah, like, they should have, have a, a bit of class. And yeah, all. no, I totally agree. I think as well, I think just keep going and uh, keep taking your kicking, come back, come home early, turn off early and you're just going to improve. As Anthony says, it's, it's all going to balance Sarah's out Sarah's speaking again. from experience there. <laughs> I, well, yes, I'm well used to getting a kick and out in the screw on the club for spin, but you can't fault me for never complaining no, and God always showing up. <laughs> Roadman, thank you for tuning in. It was Sarah's birthday this week. So if you want to wish her happy birthday, you can do it over on X. I hope you enjoyed today's video. It's good to be back doing the rider support. If you enjoyed this, there's another podcast up here, which I know you're going to like. And please subscribe to the channel down here because we're back post Vuelta and post Sarah absconding for Ross Naman MC duties. We're back on a regular cadence. So good to be back.